I think the journalists were just getting desperate for stories. Many years ago, I worked with a journalist called Robert Heller, who was very famous as a Financial Times journalist. And he said, it doesn't really matter what you write. It doesn't really matter whether the story is true. The only thing about writing stories that are not true is if your audience finds out they're not true, but they still watch. That kind of tells you a lot about what sort of an audience you've got. Folks, on this episode of Big Boy Pants Golf, I go back to the UK with Chris. He's very British. And we're going to get this perspective from <laughs> the British side about the Ryder Cup. Because from the American side, when you look at the views and the ratings, it was a total flop. Uh, we loved it. <laughs> we loved the Ryder Cup. The weird thing was, I think, uh, we were not surprised that we won. I think everybody who spoke to thought we were going to win. I was in Italy five or six weeks ago, and everybody I spoke to in Italy said, we're going to win, we're going to win. I think we were surprised that we had a clean sweep on the first morning. But after that, I think it was, it felt inevitable that we were going to win. I don't think we thought the Americans were preparing for this in a very serious way. And, and that story, when we get on to some of these stories that surrounded the, uh, the Ryder Cup, that story about... Uh, Gave journalists a lot of opportunity to really dig in and uh, have a go at the Americans. Well, a lot of that is because, as you pointed out, Americans in Vegas area, we wake up and all of a sudden we're already down 4-0. So the Americans are already in a huge hole right after the morning yeah. matches. After the second matches, I wake up the second morning and they're down like 9.5 to 2.5 already. Something like that ridiculous. Now the drama's gone. So you had yeah. horrible ratings in the States, almost down, you know, half from like 2018. How were the ratings in the UK? I think they were pretty good. Everybody I knew was watching. Uh, my sons were listening on the radio all the time while they were supposed to be at work. <laughs> People were tracking this all the time and watching it with great interest and enthusiasm and watching it end to end. It was interesting when Rory McIlroy got very angry about that situation uh, on the second day. People said, that's what we need to see. That's what the Europeans have got. They've got fire. They've got enthusiasm. That anger is all about being committed, all about this really, really matters. And the Americans didn't really come across as sophisticated, as disconnected. I don't know. Did it feel that way from your side? I feel from the U.S. side, there were certain other players that could have been picked. It was obviously a nightmare having Fowler, Spieth, and JT. And, and if anything, JT played much better than Spieth and Fowler. Then you had uh, Zach Johnson saying that maybe there's an illness going around. But bottom line, whatever the U.S. team did, they were down in a deep hole on Friday, which gets me to kind of what I think, to me, is the main point of this matter. Now you've got the production companies needing drama. So suddenly we have oh, yeah. drama in the form of toward the end of the match, there's word on the street from the actual announcer saying that Patrick Cantley wasn't wearing a hat because he said, if I'm gonna wear a hat, I'm gonna get paid to wear a hat. And so initially this was passed off as reality. You had the European crowds reacting to that, waving their hats. This created more drama with Patrick Cantley. Yeah. And then it went over into Joe LaCava, Rory McIlroy, but then later, we have Patrick Cantley calling out the media saying, hey, that didn't happen. And luckily, we delayed talking about this because now you got Michael Bamberger from Fire, uh, the Fire Pit Collection, one of Alan Shipnuck's cohorts, saying, hey, Steve Sands, Golf Channel guy, actually confirms this. So it's not anonymous anymore. There's three other guys who will confirm that Patrick Cantley said on the tee, something along the lines of if I'm not get, I'll, I'll, I'll wear a hat if I'm get, getting paid for it and he pointed to a PGA of America higher up. I bet you he's not the only one to say we should get paid for this. I mean, hey, everybody there's getting paid. The cameramen are getting paid. The commentators, the guys selling the hamburgers, the guys selling the tickets, the, the marshals, the, this, maybe some of the marshals are doing it as volunteers, but virtually everybody there doing a professional job is getting paid. 
and you hear a story like uh, was it NBC got paid you know paid up sixty million dollars for the TV rights for this sixty million dollars where's this I mean I would be saying if I were a player where's the sixty million dollars you remember in the Jerry Maguire that the guy said show me the money show me the money where's the sixty million dollars gone who's got that that's our money without us actually playing. There's no $60 million. Why is everybody earning a living off the back of us playing for free and we're getting nothing? This, this sounds grossly unfair. I can't believe that Cantley, out of the two dozen players, he's the only one saying, we ought to be getting paid for this or something. We ought to get something for this. Well, it's also interesting because to me it's shades of Phil Mickelson saying how the PGA Tour is supposed to act on their behalf with this money and pay it out as part of their pension plans, but instead they kind of hoard the money, and that's why they had that extra $100 million reserve to all of a sudden beef up all these signature or designated events. Mm. The purses last year, some of them went from you know, 6 to $8 million to $24 million. Suddenly they, this, ma this money magically appears. So these guys right now, their money is supposed to kind of go to them because it's a, a membership-run organization where it's not supposed to go to the executives. It's yeah. supposed to be for the benefit of the players. So right now we're right back into the situation where Phil was right. It doesn't feel like it's a membership organization one bit. When Jay Monaghan talks, he doesn't talk like he's the head of a, a union or a members organization or the head of a members golf club. He talks like he's running a corporation, that he's the chief exec and he's got some directors and we will decide. This whole thing about getting paid is a... Uh, a rat's nest of problems. Well, it's the similar situation before where players were not necessarily happy with the compensation. The PGA Tour tried to pitch the meritocracy argument, and then all of a sudden, mm. as Liv appears, they have tons more money. So I don't see what, the, what leg the golf establishment is standing on right now because they've already used that argument of, you know, earn the money through meritocracy, but now they're already finding more funds to play the players. They're, the PGA Tour is and the, the PGA Tour establishment, they're, as you pointed out earlier, these guys are the ones who are doing the work. They're not benefiting from, from, from the money, and mm. with the money that they do get, it's supposed to go to a pension plan for them, but that's still going to be spread around the other 200 members. So the guys who are actually doing the work aren't getting their fair share of the money as per the work that they're doing. I can't imagine anybody taking up professional golf and wanting to be a top 10 player based on... Uh actually wanting to secure a pension plan for 200 other players. <laughs> There's some, something culturally off about that particular model. I think players are looking out for themselves. They're playing for themselves. They're winning the money for themselves. Um, everything that I hear about professional players from professional coaches or anybody that has anything to do with it says these guys are going for the money. They go for the money. Uh, because they don't know how long they're going to be able to play really well uh, and they want that money in the bank and they don't want a great pot of money in the bank for everybody and somehow in uh, by the time they reach 55 you can have what a hundred thousand dollars a year or something when you get to 55 I think in the future I mean people uh, on TV were talking about the next time we meet for the Ryder Cup the Saudis are going to be involved. Maybe the merger will be finished. Maybe it'll be different. And I think with the Saudis running something like this, it's going to be far more businesslike. And I think the players will get paid. It's interesting that you're bringing up Liv because you got Steve Sands, the guy who initially breaks the story that Patrick Canley had mentioned, I want to, I'll wear a hat if I get paid for it. And Steve Sands, three months earlier, is at an interview during the Canadian Open bashing Liv. I have a hard time thinking that the PGA Tour is ever going to look like Liv. I'm with you on Liv. I think it's goofy looking. Uh, I don't like the shorts. I think there's something you aspire when you're a golfer. I'm a sports fan who just does golf. But golfers aspire to be PGA Tour players. They aspire to be professionals. As soon as Michael Bamberger from the Fire Pit Collective, who is obviously a cohort with Alan Shipnuck, who tried to kind of bring down Phil Mickelson initially in the beginning, he also put out a early Patrick Cantley article regarding the hat and then it went from the suspicion that Patrick Cantley wanted to get paid down to uh, his involvement on the board and that maybe he'd vote against Liv. 
So these, there's still a lot of this anti-live sentiment from these guys creating this Patrick Cantlay narrative where Michael Bamberger, a few days earlier in his one article, puts out Cantlay as a hero and now wants to make him a villain mm. all the span of three or four days once something is confirmed just because Cantlay pointed out that this whole thing was a fabrication due to one journalist, and that journalist is Jamie Weir. Tell me about Jamie Weir in the UK. I don't think people know that much about him. I, I know that he plays golf, but I don't think he... I don't think he was ever a professional, was he? Um, he's a bit of a mystery, really. Uh, but then, so were... For this, so were a lot of the other commentators. I don't know whether you actually got to see the celebrity match the day before it started on the... When would that be? Thursday. On the Thursday, there was a celebrity golf match. And they had, in the UK, they had the most weird commentators. One of the commentators was uh, an ex-contestant to Love Island. Do you have Love, Love Island in America? Where everybody goes to an island and try to make you out with each it. other. <laughs> it's probably... It's probably too blunt even for the American audience. <laughs> you basically go to an island and try to make love to each other. And one of these contestants is there trying to interview uh, uh, Montgomery and Luke. <laughs> you think, this is weird. This is really weird. In trying to popularise golf, they're kind of losing the very thing that golf is. It's losing that sort of edge. I can remember when I, the first round of golf I played, I felt honoured to actually get out on the course and be allowed on the course. And in those days, the pro would watch you and see that you could actually play well. Otherwise, he'd come out to the first team and say, come with me, come with me. I'll give you, I'm going to give you money back. You obviously can't play well enough to play on the course. We seem to have gone in the opposite direction. And if we're not careful, the Ryder Cup is an example of where we're going. It, it is ironic that, Rory should go on and on about how much he hates live golf. I hate live golf. I hate live golf. And I love the Ryder Cup. I love... Hold on, Rory. The Ryder Cup is exactly like playing in a live event. What is different to a live event from the Ryder Cup? A rowdy, drunken crowd of reduced numbers. I think there were like 40,000, 50,000 people in Rome. I mean... Taking it to Rome was a problem anyway because it made the time zones even more difficult. I don't know, I don't know how you managed in uh, Las Vegas or California because you were nine hours out, ten hours out, something like that, which must have been very, very difficult. But uh, you you put this event in the UK, um, and you get two hundred thousand people. Easy, easy, two hundred thousand people straight away. You put it in Rome, you can't sell tickets to the Italians because they don't play a lot of golf in Italy because of the water shortages. It's just too expensive to maintain the courses. So it's in the wrong place for a start. It should have been uh, further east, which would have made it easier. So, for instance, there was a newspaper called The Star, I think it was, in the UK, that constantly the headlines were just nonsense. I think you, you've got something called the Inquirer. It's like that. And the headline would be, My wife gave birth to seven pound duck. And that would be the daily headline. B-52 bombers photographed on the moon. I remember mean, these most outrageous stories. And yet they had 120,000 people bought the newspaper with no adverts. And he said, there's an example of, everybody knows it's a rubbish story, but there's 120,000 gullible people to advertise to. So if, it, if in golf, all that really matters is an audience, any audience, then why not make up these stories? How do you know whether this story is true? And somebody would say, would be saying like Homer Simpson, it doesn't matter. <laughs> do you know why? Because people tune up to see if Rory is actually going to swing a punch. Is it going to get even worse on the next day? What if Rory gets drawn with Cantlay again? Oh, is he actually going to hit him, you know? And the journalists will wind, the TV companies will wind this up because it generates an audience. Is it true? They'd say, well, does it really matter? 
And maybe what we're seeing here is is that. Because I honestly think, I was talking to somebody the other day about, is it called Full Swing, the TV um, reality show on golf? Is Full Swing really what you think you're watching? Or is it like a nature program where you film the lion walking around, you film the lion running, you film an antelope eating grass, you film a lion eating an antelope, another lion chasing an antelope and you put all that together and they're all different antelopes and they're all different lions but you put it all together as though it's one lion chasing an antelope and it catches the antelope and eats it and then you have a narrative over the background i wonder sometimes with a lot of this reality stuff and what netflix is trying to do and what the golf channel and whatever is trying to do with something like the Ryder cup are you almost filming something and then trying to put a story to it afterwards? Because it's good for the ratings? I don't know. What do you think? I mean, American television is kind of ahead of Europe in doing this sort of stuff. I think you absolutely nailed it. Just like Love Island, they take tons of footage and then you can piece together yeah. how you want a story arc to go. Yeah. Obviously, at the end, there's a lot of hooking up. But on the golf course, and the same thing with the, the full swing series... I'm glad you brought it up because that was part of the issue. It was that apparently Xander wasn't in the, the series for the second season, so they wanted him to sign some kind of release so they, they could video in the U.S. Ryder Cup team room. And then that, he almost got kicked off the team because he wouldn't sign it. And then his father, Xander's father, has been a vocal advocate for, hey, these guys should get paid, just like Phil was back in the day. So what happens? You're getting uh, vilified. Obviously, you're a spoiled yeah. rich guy. Why are you complaining about the money? But we have no situation where the people doing the work don't get paid and everyone else feeds off it. That's very much like that Netflix uh, series Squid Game, which made like a billion dollars. But the guy who actually wrote it, I think he made under less than 200 grand. And they didn't hook him up with more money later. It was just like, well, you got what a writer gets paid. <laughs> but you had the idea. <laughs> he was selling like uh, his laptops just to live with his parent, his mom or something, just to scratch by, sell it to Netflix, and mm. they make a billion off a of Squid Game, and he's, he's not set for life. Well, my golf, the guy that I did lessons from most recently, he, uh, he's got a couple of professionals that he coaches, and he got an invite to Paris. I don't know whether he went to Rome, because I haven't seen him the, the last year. But he went to Paris as a putting coach and he was telling me stories about what was going on. He was the one who told me that Phil Mickelson, of course, turned up and he was really out of practice. Phil Mickelson had stopped playing golf in August and here we were, you know, well into September. And it was that whole sort of he's had five weeks off because he doesn't play golf in the winter, he said. Oh, so I've got to believe him because he's on the inside looking at this sort of stuff. And then he saw Tiger Woods walking across the room and Tiger really looked not very well at all. And and he was saying, I don't think he should have ever been there. He shouldn't have been playing, but he did. So all sorts of stuff goes on behind the scenes that we don't hear about. And then journalists like Jamie Weir seems to say things like, uh, well, I spoke to Cantlay's uh, agent. Uh, would you like to name his agent? No. <laughs> I spoke to his agent, right, an, uh, an unknown person, and he would neither confirm nor deny that Cantalay had said that he wants money. I mean, for God's sake, how distant can you... I mean, this is no evidence at all. I mean, did he say it or not? Well, I can't confirm or deny. Well, that probably means he did. Well, I can't tell you. <laughs> it mean, what, does, what does that mean? That means... Jamie Weir is on the outside. I think Jamie Weir speaks like he's bestest mates with all these people. Uh, you know, I, I think he'd like to be saying, you know, in the off season, we're out together playing golf and having a meal and drinks together. But I doubt whether that's happening. I'd like to say that I speak to these guys during the week and they give me insights to what's going on. But all we actually see is Jamie Weir asking questions in general press conferences like everybody else like you and i can go and do that if we can get a press card you and i can go and ask questions of golfers in a press conference 
that doesn't mean that we're learning anything from the inside. It doesn't mean that we're learning anything that's confidential or the truth of anything. We're just at the press conference. I mean, is, is that as good as it gets? To me, it's a weird standard that Jamie Weir puts out in that now you have to deny every point he makes, otherwise you're tacitly accepting it. Yeah. So you see that yeah. a lot on X, on Twitter or X, that, well, people will, will defend that by saying, well, he didn't deny it, so that means that Brooks Koepka actually wept with his mother, even though Brooks Koepka's mom then comes out and says that never happened. So you have all these journalists now, they're just throwing whatever hits the wall, and whatever you can't disprove, they get to slip in as, as evidence of, of their version of events. Well, I think it was you said, uh, um, what's his name? Shipnut said this thing about, uh, what was he? He asserted something and then he repeated it twice and then everybody else started talking about it. And it's like complete fabrication. You've started this hair running and everybody picks up on it because, well, that sounds like a good story. Let's, we'll run with it as well. And then we'll run with it. And everybody's running with this story that you made up in the first place. But they're running with it because you can get ratings using it. You, and at the end of it, you can deny it. You can say, well, I never started it. It wasn't my... I didn't do it. I'm innocent, well, Governor. I've actually got perfect evidence of... We've got Jamie Weir with his tweet starting the idea that Patrick Cantlay wanted money for the Ryder Cup and that's why he's not wearing a hat. And then he's also reporting this on Sky Sports that according to sources, hmm. this is what's going on. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. the source. So he's, it's a complete situation where the guy, a firefighter lights the fire and then puts it out. Well, I think the, I think the clue is you say, sources tell me that. I mean, it's the classic sort of government leak, isn't it? A source close to government has told me this. Well, actually, you were given it because they wanted it publicised. Or, yeah, you can't really say sources close to Cantlay told me this. Well, who told you? Who were these sources? Why aren't you telling me who they are? Even if you can't tell me their names, can you tell me are they other members of the team? Are they part of the coaching team? Part of the support team? Because there are a lot of people there at an event like this. I mean, for every golfer, there's five or six support people on their team. You know, nutritionalists, physios, uh, keep fit guys, a putting coach, a swing coach, a short game coach. And what well, is it? One of those? Is it? Is it that? Is it one of those guys that did it? Or, but you know, when you don't say anybody, when you just say sources tell me that, well, then you can fill in the gap. It's like fill in whatever you want, and you say, well, who told you that? I've forgotten who told me that now. I mean, it's completely deniable, isn't it? Well, I, you know, my journalists, I can't tell you. <laughs> it's ridiculous. The truth doesn't matter because on, on some level, the point isn't yeah. bringing out the truth. It's to actually, in my opinion, silence Shoffley and Cantlay because now you've basically dog whistled and said, and you've sent all of Twitter and the public against these guys. So at least a certain percentage of these people out there who will fill in the gaps themselves and want to view Cantlay as negative in a negative fashion or Shoffley in a negative fashion as greedy, entitled, what have you, will now turn their negative energy on these guys. And this sends mm. a signal out to the rest of the PGA Tour guys, Just keep your head down, be quiet, right? Or the, otherwise, this is what happens to me. I totally believe at this point that Shoffley and Cantlay will go to live next year. And the, you always get this super negative press before you go, if the press gets wind of it. Remember what happened to Cameron Smith mm. at the British Open? Yeah. That once they got yeah. kind of wind that he's going to go, now it's full of torpedoes on you. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what happens. They build you up and they bash you down again. It's because the building up gets people look reading and then bashing them down again gets people reading. So they don't really mind which way they're going. But I think you can also, in these situations, you can very often read uh, read into them what is not said what is not said nobody on the team and there's 11 other members of the team are with Cantlay saying I'm not wearing my hat you know there was a, there was accusations that he was sort of sitting in the corner separate from the team he wasn't going to wear the hat because uh, he said the hat didn't fit uh, 
Uh, I'm not going to wear the hat because I'm not going to get paid. I can kind of think of better ways of showing my displeasure than not wearing a hat. But nobody else jumped in and said, oh yeah, that's what's happening. You've got 11 other players on the team and nobody says, no, this story is rubbish. This is not what's going on. No, no, Cantlay's not like that. He's our best mate and he's part of the team and we're drinking buddies and we love him. Nobody else. You can't imagine a, you can't imagine a football team or a basketball team behaving like this, you know, where one of their number gets picked on by the press and everybody else sits on their hands and go, I'm not saying anything. <laughs> he's, he's brought this on himself. I'm not saying anything. I mean, this is an event where you're supposed to be functioning as a team. Everybody talks about this team thing. Kepka talked about the glue of the team and we were more of a team this time than we've ever been before. We're a team, we're a team. But nobody stepped up and said anything about Kentley or anything about anything. So do we read into this uh, an order of silence? Has somebody told them not to speak to the press at, at all about anything? Or did Cantlay actually do this stuff and people just thought, oh, we'll just let him stew in it? Or personally, I can imagine Cantlay not being a particularly likeable guy. He seems very, very dour, very stern. And, um, yeah. I don't know. What do you what do you think? Do you, do, am I reading him wrongly? He's an American. Am I am I reading him wrongly? Because for an American, he seems very. Uh, I was going to say negative. Perhaps that's the wrong word. But do you don't, do you know what I mean? A hundred percent. But remember, a few years ago when he was in a playoff with Bryson DeChambeau, and DeChambeau was the bad guy. Cantley was being yeah. celebrated. They were asking about, yeah. hey, what happens if you win the pip money? You're Patty Ice. People are loving the guy. After the Masters, all of a sudden he became slow play Cantlay, and he became the new guy to hate on a little bit, right? And now, you know, they're always looking for their next target. Now they've made him the, the villain, the bad guy in, in this respect. Now everyone's going to associate him with greed, not really playing for his country. And then Jamie Weir also, not only does he say that, you know, he, he's not going to play because he wants more money, but then he pivots into the fact that this is causing a rift in the team room. So we don't even know if there's a, a rift in the team room, but now it's a, it's a statement of fact from Jamie Weir that there is a rift in the team room and it's because of Cantlay. How can there be a rift in the team room when one of the big reasons that they picked the team that they picked and their justification for the captain's picks was all to do with creating um, a team feeling, creating a... Um, a sort of gravitational pull between the players that they were all pulled together and they were all looking out for each other. And I mean, where does this story about this trouble in the team room come from? If this other story that I've picked all these guys because they all get on well together, I've picked these guys because some of them asked me to pick them because they wanted this friend on the team because they'd be good for the team. You can't have it both ways. You can't have like this... There's uh, rumblings in the team. There's some team discontent. But that's, you pick the team so they'd be like bestest buddies that would be, as soon as the Ryder Cup's over, we're going camping together. <laughs> we're on a holiday together. I don't know. I, I don't... The story... The, the interesting thing about all these stories is if you lay them all out, they just don't seem to have any sense to them. They just don't seem to fit together as a set. One doesn't lead to the other. They're like these isolated things that people just, that have been stated by Jamie Weir and the, um, and the money thing. It just sits on its own. Trouble in the team room sits on its own. Nobody ever talks about it really, except the captain. Uh, there's illness in the team room. Well, wouldn't somebody, wouldn't someone's physio I mean, there must be 12 members of the team. There must be 12 physios and 12 fitness trainers. I mean, there's an awful lot of people that would blab to the press, aren't there? Oh, but none of them did? Really? Maybe this story just doesn't exist. 
and nobody knows that they're supposed to be leaking a pretend story. How, how can that be? Well, to me, the, the bigger picture is when you take a step back, you've got Michael Bamberger with the Fire Pit Collective, anti-live. You've got Steve Sands, as I pointed out before, anti-live. All the Golf Channel guys, Steve Sands is a, is a Golf Channel guy. You've got the NBC, the Peacock Factor, where this is being shown. This is all being controlled by the PGA Tour side. They're all affiliates with the PGA Tour. They have partnership deals with the PGA Tour. Mm. The, the live agreement right now, if you look at it, it doesn't look like it's going through, certainly in 2023, if at all. So now is it also an attempt to, to bash live again? Is, is that what this whole thing is about on a low key level before potentially Cantlay and Shoffley go over to live and at some point, you get a few more of these PGA Tour guys, and they're five to seven of the top 20. Live is by far and away the number one tour in the world. Well, yeah, and it can expand. We just hollow it out. We just make it, we just make the PGA Tour the one that the TV companies really don't want to watch because it's, a, it's become a B team, it's become a B league. You know, if you, if you went through uh, football or, uh, or baseball and you ripped out 80 of the top players out of those sports, would those sports be the same without those 80 top players? They wouldn't. The players are what people are watching. And maybe, you know, maybe people have got objections about what live golf is like, but live can morph and change. You know, if, if having a band playing in the pavilion is not the right thing to do, if uh, all the different things that they do, the noisy stuff that they do, if you start changing that and you make that more like the PGA, live tour looks better and better to TV companies and sponsors and... Um, if you holler out the PGA Tour, there's only one way this thing's going. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have been here. Folks at home, what do you think about the state of golf journalism right now? 